Welcome to this Deep Lizard course on Generative Adversarial Networks. I'm Mandy, and in this episode, we'll get our first introduction to these Generative Adversarial Networks, otherwise known as GANs. And we'll also be covering the prerequisites required for this course, as well as going through an overview of what this course has in store for us overall. Generative adversarial networks, most commonly referred to as GANs, are an amazing deep learning tool that we can use to create new data. This is in great contrast to many of the applications of deep learning that we see and use today that are used for classification purposes to classify existing data. In this course, we'll be starting from the basics by covering the fundamental building blocks that make up GANs. And by the end of this course, we'll be implementing GANs in code to generate cool new creations. GANs can be applied in a number of ways. And one of the most common use cases of GANs is for image generation. This application of GANs alone is already used across a number of disciplines, including art, advertising, fashion, video games, face filters, architecture design, and so much more. The application of GANs has not just been confined to imagery, though. They've also been used to create audio and 3D models and lots of miscellaneous other applications across differing fields. So now we're going to explore a very well-known GAN called StyleGAN2 that has been used to generate images of human faces. At the website thispersondoesnotexist.com, we can flip through various images of human faces that have been created by this GAN, and as we can see, these faces look extremely realistic. So looking at this first example, this person literally does not exist. So the GAN was able to create this image of this person that looks so realistic that even to us humans who are really good at being able to identify fellow humans aren't able to necessarily look at this image and tell that this is not of a real person. We have such subtle details like individual wisps of hair that are a bit out of place but very natural in human hair and the reflections of the light off of the teeth and the natural creases in the face around the mouth and the eyes from the person smiling. It's just totally unbelievable that this isn't a real person. Yet, it's not. It was created by a GAN. So we can click on another to get another face. Again, this person looks extremely realistic. So what's fun to kind of do when you look at these images is to look and see if there's anything that sticks out as being maybe uncanny or just out of place that the GAN may have gotten a little wrong and alerting us to the fact that this is truly not a real person and was created by a neural network. And I've seen a lot of times that glasses on these faces will give it away. Uh, this one, not so much. So these glasses look pretty well formed, but sometimes the glasses will be a bit misshapen or not completely formed. Maybe right here on this outside right edge, we can see like it's not fully there at this point, but it's not really catching our eye. It, it could just be the fact that the light is hitting the frame in a certain way that's making it seem more transparent over here. So again, we have this very realistic looking image. I'm trying to go through and find one where something is just really off that we can see, but these are chosen at random, so I don't have control over that. Uh, this here, nothing is necessarily alerting me to the fact that this image has been generated. On the ear here, we see kind of like something a little bit weird going on where it looks like a drop of liquid is like hanging off the ear and it's kind of like merging with the background. Hopefully that will resolve in this video where you can see that the ear and the background here are kind of doing something weird. Something that's kind of interesting about this face though, if we just look at the facial features here, this face is extremely symmetric. And we know oftentimes that humans don't have extremely symmetric faces. So we'll have these different asymmetries on each side of our face. But if we just look at the individual eyes, for example, and the eyebrows, they look very, very symmetric. So that might alert us a little bit, but really not too much. This photo still looks extremely realistic in terms of being a believable looking 
real human. Okay, really, this one doesn't have anything that's alerting me immediately to it being fake either. The only thing is like maybe the texture of the hair and the skin here look a bit non-photorealistic. And then we've got some kind of weird stuff going on with the background here. Like this could just be a piece of fabric or the jacket of him or the person next to him, but it kind of looks a little weird. And so does this hair here. So we know we'll notice that sometimes the backgrounds of these images is what gives the uh, non-realness away. So I'm just going to go through a few of these quickly and see if any of them immediately alert us to the fact that they're fake. And if we find one, then we'll stop there. Besides the hard edge of this guy's face and against the background here being a little off looking, this one looks pretty realistic as well. So now we have an image of a child and the only thing that's sticking out, let's see, for this one is that the eyebrow here looks like it's kind of not completely formed. So we have some wisp of hair, but it's not full like this eyebrow is. This one looks pretty realistic to me, nothing sticking out. So earlier I talked about how glasses that aren't fully formed or that are misshapen can kind of give away the fact that the image isn't real or isn't of a real person. The same is true for earrings. We'll see often when we're flipping through these images. So for this particular person, we have this earring here. It actually looks pretty good relative to some that I've seen. But if we look down towards the bottom of this earring, we see that it's kind of misshapen and just looks a little bit wacky. So if we're really paying attention, then we'd be able to tell that this doesn't necessarily seem totally realistic. But generally speaking, it looks pretty good. All right, this one, the main subject of the photo looks pretty real. But in the background, we have this... Um, kind of creeper of an uncanny looking character <laughs> uh, showing through. So this also almost looks kind of cartoonish or a little bit animated looking. And we see this weird like half formed glasses with this like cartoonish looking eye. So it's the background or the not the subject of the photo, at least that is giving away the fact that this image is has been generated. So for this one, we can see that the face of this person is looking pretty believable, as well as the hair and the background. However, the hand here is looking a bit misformed and not truly believable in this image. So uh, we're able to look at that and it alerts us to the fact that something's going on here and it doesn't necessarily seem to be a realistic image. So head over to thispersondoesnotexist.com to go through some of these images yourselves. It's actually a pretty fun exercise to go through and search for any anomalies that are sticking out to alert us to the fact that the image has been generated by a network and isn't of an actual human being. And sometimes these things that alert us can be very strange or creepy or funny. So it's a fun exercise, like I said. So head over to the website now to check that out. So now that we've had a brief introduction about what GANs can do, we're now going to go into what exactly is a GAN and what are the components that make up one. GANs were first introduced in a paper published in 2014 by Ian Goodfellow and some of his colleagues. A GAN is actually made up of two neural networks, with one of the networks being called the generator and the other network being called the discriminator. We're going to be covering each of these networks in full detail in later episodes, but for now, we're just going to get an intuitive introduction to each of them. First, we'll discuss the generator network. The generator's objective is to create data that is very realistic or perceived to be real. So let's use images as our data type. The generator network will receive some type of input, which we'll elaborate more on at a later time, and then from this input, the generator will generate images. And the goal is to make these images seem very realistic, just like the ones that we were just looking at on thispersondoesnotexist.com. So that is the most brief and general description of the generator network within a GAN. Now we'll discuss the discriminator network. The goal of the discriminator network is to look at the images created by the generator and decide whether or not these images are real or fake. 
Actually, a discriminator network is just a pretty standard binary classifier that classifies data between two different categories. In the case of GANs, those two categories are real and fake. So that is the most brief and general description of the discriminator network. And as mentioned, we'll be going into much, much more detail about the generator and discriminator in upcoming episodes. So now that we have our most basic introduction of what a GAN is under our belts, let's now talk about this course specifically and what the prerequisites are to follow this course. In terms of deep learning and neural network understandings, this course is not for absolute beginners. You first need to have all of the fundamental knowledge regarding deep learning and neural networks before you can take this course. And you can get all of that from our deep learning fundamentals course on deeplizard.com before you start this one. That course will get you fully acquainted with deep learning and neural networks so that you can then come back to this course and build on that knowledge. Later in the course, we'll be developing a GAN code project. So you'll need to have some basic coding skills and some experience with Python. It's also recommended that you have some experience with a neural network API like PyTorch or TensorFlow or Keras, for example. It's not 100% required as we'll be going step by step through the code that make use of these APIs, but it is recommended so that you can have a general feel for how they work. And we have courses for each of the APIs that I just mentioned on deeplizard.com, so you can go there to check those out. So now we'll cover a quick overview of what this course has in store for us. So we'll be starting out with getting an introduction to GANs by talking about all of the individual components that make up a GAN, and then we'll move on to the GAN training process and all that's involved there. Then we'll take all of that knowledge that we learned in the first part of the course and apply it to the GAN code project. So we'll get introduced to deep convolutional GANs for which we will then implement across two neural network APIs, one being PyTorch and the other being TensorFlow. You can head over to the corresponding blog for this episode on dblizzard.com to further review the syllabus for all of the details, as well as look at the course resources available as well. I hope that you're as excited as I am about starting this course, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Hey, thanks so much for watching this episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. To see more content from us, check out our second channel called Deep Blizzard Vlog on YouTube. And be sure to check out the corresponding blog for this episode on deepblizzard.com for additional resources. And while you're at it, consider joining the Deep Blizzard Hive Mind, where you'll gain access to exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you next time.